Hey all you people, what's going on? Today we have a 2008 Toyota Sequoia, and today we're gonna see how well it's aged. First, we're gonna go through the exterior, then the interior, then we'll take a look at the drivetrain, and then we'll take a look at the reliability. Wow, what a surprise. This feels exactly like the Toyota Tundra that it's based on. Who would have guessed? So we've got just about 129,000 miles on this unit, which if you do the math, this is a 2008. Um, it's about 11,000 miles a year, give or take. So not too much on this thing. The owner has a really short commute to work. So first things first, let's touch upon the looks of this beast. It looks very similar to the Tundra, uh, the same front fascia. So it feels roughly the same size. The Tundra is just a little longer. I've never been a huge fan of the way the Sequoias looked. I just think they look a little too bloated, a little too rounded off in the back, especially. Um, and their fenders are just a little too swollen looking, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's the right word for it. I personally like the looks of well, the Tahoe, the Suburban, and uh, the Ford Expedition more. This looks like the typical uncle you'd see at a cookout with a beer belly. Handsome, strong, but bloated. All right, this is a big vehicle. I'm gonna go through a car wash. We'll see how confident I am in this. Yeah, the nose of this is kind of vague. It drops off, so it's hard to tell exactly where it's pointed. All right. Thank you, Ver. Thank you, Ver. Did I just say thank you, Ver? Thank you very much. The owner of this did say that there was an issue with the sunroof is making a noise or something like that. So if I get sprayed in the face through the sunroof right now, don't be surprised. <laughs> Things wide. So far, so good. Now comes the hurricane. Let's see. It's rattling, but it's not leaking anything. So that's good. Success. Success. Alrighty, next let's talk about the interior. When the Sequoia first came out in 2008, it was pretty much the same exact thing as the Tundra. When it first came out, it wasn't ahead of its time. Now it's pretty outdated. You have hard plastics. Everything is built well, but it's not pleasant to touch. Like just beefy, everything's beefy. Uh, these knobs here are beefy. They're designed to be used with gloves. Interior room, it's spacious in here. I wish there was a little more headroom, but you've got huge center console, a ton of storage here on the sides, these, these bins, these cup holders. You got two different glove compartments here, various storage in the back here and even in the third row. One thing that I wish was a little different is um, the padding in these seats. I think that they're a little stiff for the amount of support that they offer. Visibility, great in here, it's great. I and mean, you've got a good functionality to all the controls, which you don't necessarily find today. A lot of people might like that. Got an outlet here, you actually have a cigarette lighter. Never used. Let's see if it still works. Hold on. Oh yeah! Dual climate controls. Actually, triple climate controls, because there's one in the rear that you can control independently. One common gripe with the tachometer, the uh, individual portholes. People said that they were hard to read. I think they're fine. I just don't like the design of them. It's some sort of trip, tripophobia. They ended up changing this display uh, a few years later. What's neat is that this is technically the SR5 model. Um, it has a lot of the creature comforts of the Limited, like the leather seats, you got the sunroof, you got the heated seats, you have the Bluetooth, auto windows. You also have this JBL audio system here, which is apparently pretty good. I don't know how much else. Oh yeah, you got power folding third row seats too. You could fit a baby in here or two. You got climate control vents in the second row and the third row. The second row is cool because it's super versatile back here. So let's go take a look at the back seats and we'll take a look at the cargo room. Oh, not bad. Oh wow, oh wow. I wasn't expecting these to recline so much, that's nice. Let's see here. So the cup holders are down here on the floor. 
Woohoo! <laughs> now I have some side bolstering here. Take it around the track, Dad! <laughs> I'm not funny. I'm. <sighs> Check this out. Can I actually. Whoa! Oh my god, my legs are so short. So now you can reach the climate controls in the front. Oh! You know, in the farthest forward position in these seats here, still more room than most crossovers and SUVs. This is sweet because it creates a perfectly flat loading floor. Boom. Do I smell overlanding vehicle or what? Shaboom, shabam. We do have power third row seats. You can lift it up. Somebody's dirty shirt is here. Okay. So now once the third row is up, then you can hit this button here. Shaboom. And it reclines the third row. You can also do it from the back here. Shaboom. There actually is some usable trunk room back here too. And you've got all your tools, what? So now you can see why this is a kid hauler. Yeah, you could definitely fit like a couple coolers back here, maybe a couple sleep bags, swimsuits, scuba gear, footballs and, and ping pong balls and ah. All right, that's how you slide it forward. So getting in is not that bad. Do a little recline. Pull the seat back. My knees are just grazing the back of this seat. I'm six feet tall. So it's actually more comfortable than some second rows nowadays in crossovers. I probably have about an inch of headroom left back here. I'm sure because of these wheel wells here though, it would be a little bit of a tight squeeze with three adults back here, but three kids, no problem. You can actually get the second row with two captain's chairs and then to get out of the third row, you just kick this little lever here or just kick the person in front of you. It doesn't, doesn't matter, same effect. So boom, and it goes forward. I'm impressed, I am impressed. You got side curtain earbags. Um, I don't think any in the third row. It's okay, it's just kids back here anyway. Now let's see what this car holds in potential for overlanding. This brings us to the most important part of the video and most anticipated. Oh my God, I'm a dumb truck. Look at it sleep, a not so handy car guy. Let's find out. Dude, this is mint. So if you guys remember, Sam and I went on a road trip and we slept in the back of the car with this exact air mattress and it was a tight fit. This is a ton wider. A foot, maybe a foot and a half more room in between the wheel wells of the Sequoia than the Forerunner, which gives you a ton of room for either a full-size air mattress or room for your gear. So yes, this will sleep a not so handy car guy, gal, gal's friend, maybe a guy friend. It would get pretty crazy in here. Which brings us to the next portion, performance, towing, and off-roading. This is not good. Okay. <laughs> Take it out of four low. So it's blinking, so it's shifting, right? It's stuck. Not good. And this center diff is stuck locked too. I'm gonna get underneath and see if I can whack on the shift solenoid with my tripod. <gasps> oh, that's a relief though. Can I unlock the differential? I hear something happening under here. For all of you who own four x four vehicles, lock and unlock your differentials, switch it to four, switch it to four low, It'll keep everything moving and, and prevent it from getting jammed. Driving might help with the differential. Ah, look at that. All right, we've got this thing figured out now. The stock ride height and tires are only set up for mild off-roading, so it's common to add coil spacers or full lift kits along with grippier rubber. When it comes to off-roading, the Sequoia is a lot like the mid-2000s 4Runner in that it offers a locking center differential and low-range gears, but open front and rear diffs. 
Even the more recent second gens don't offer Toyota's A-Track or multi-terrain select system, like in the current 4Runners and Tacomas. Instead, it uses Auto LSD, which is basically a heightened traction control system that helps make up for its open differentials. But with this feature, you still don't want to get cross-axled on the trail. Performance. Um, you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with this 5.7 liter V8 from Toyota. This makes 381 brake horsepower and 401 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, this is found in multiple cars throughout their lineup. The Tundra, the Land Cruiser, and the Sequoia. Great engine. It's known to be very reliable, not known to be fuel efficient. It's kind of archaic in design. Uh, it still uses port injection, still uses a physical fan clutch. Everything's tried and true technology. Um, and that's what Toyota's all about. They're always a step behind people because what do they do? They let, they let the Germans and the Americans innovate and then they just perfect. This thing has no trouble getting up to speed. And right here, we're gonna insert a nice zero to 60 test. Most people who buy this use it for towing. Otherwise, the gas mileage just doesn't justify buying this. It gets about 13 in the city, 17 on the highway, which is... And the owner says he's averaging probably around 14 MPG because he drives a lot of city. They do tow a camper with this. It's about 8,000 pounds. Uh, and it tows it very well, they say. It gets right up to speed. It feels very secure and confident on the road. Uh, nice wide wheelbase to this thing. This does have the factory towing package. The owner says it was rated at 9,600 pounds from the factory. So this thing is a towing beast, that's for sure. I remember in the ad campaigns back in 2008, they actually had this towing, uh, one of those old Airstreams out into the desert with their family. and. your world I was lost in mine Excellent marketing because that made me instantly want my parents to get one. Where it differs from the Tundra and the chassis and the drivetrain mainly is that this has independent rear suspension and the Tundra has a solid rear axle. That inevitably decreases the hardiness of the chassis, but it adds compliance and comfort in ride, which is more important in an SUV like this in a family hauler than it is in a truck. For being a 12 year old truck, you know, it, it does lean a little bit in the turns, but it's overall very secure and doesn't feel like it is as big as it is. Probably within the next couple years, it could use a suspension refresh. The engine doesn't sound as refined as I thought it would, being based off of the 2UZ FE, which is based off the 1UZ FE, both very smooth revving, smooth sounding engines. This one sounds a little more coarse. Oh yeah. This engine's got the torques. Huh, kind of a driveline whine. It's probably a differential or something. Maybe it needs to have its fluid flushed. Okay, now the cherry on top of everything. Let's talk about the reliability of this unit. Uh, just a disclaimer, these problems that I'm listening here, uh, the owner of this has had none of them, um, but it's just common issues that I found online or not so common, but issue number one is electrical issues with the radio. Apparently the radio just decides, hey, I'm gonna turn off right now. Another slightly common issue is piston slap upon cold start. Again, the owner of this has not had that. The engine doesn't sound super smooth, but uh, it's not piston slap. Another common complaint from Toyota customers is chipping, peeling, or fading paint. I noticed that with our 4Runner, but not so much on this. Uh, the only spot I found that happening is on the roof rails and that's not a huge deal. Another problem that's not super common, but I have seen a couple places is the 5.7 having trouble starting in cold weather due to a coolant temperature gauge malfunction. So they had to get that replaced. Another thing I heard of is a uh, ticking noise coming from a timing chain because of worn out timing chain tensioners. That's thought to be caused by use of kind of poor quality oil, which doesn't keep that timing chain guide clean. Um, and then it just leads to premature wear. More of a user error than a Toyota error. And another one, this has to do with the Flex Fuel 5.7s, uh, the E85 engines. 
uh, and that is the head gasket failure. That's just what I heard. They're not quite as reliable as the regular 5.7s. And lastly, uh, this one's pretty common is actually the secondary air injection system failing. Uh, what that is is basically just an air mattress pump attached to the exhaust. It just pumps a lot of air in upon cold start and that heats up the catalytic converters really quickly. It's just, it's, it's an emissions thing and uh, it fails very often, especially in the 2U ZFEs, like in the 4Runner. You can either get that bypass before it breaks or you can replace it when it does break. That hasn't happened on this yet. Like I said, more common on the 4.7s than the 5.7s. Overall, it looks like this is a very good drivetrain. The three things that the owner of this has had go wrong is number one, the sunroof. He said it was making really weird creaking noises uh, when it was open and he's afraid to open it again because it might get stuck. The other one was the electrical panel on the driver's side door. Um, they had that replaced under a recall from Toyota, actually, so he didn't have to pay for that. I don't know exactly what malfunctioned. Another common issue with early second-gen Sequoias is frame rust. What a surprise coming from Toyota, right? As you can see on this example, the rear cross member is pretty rotted out. Thankfully, that's a fairly easy thing to replace. And another thing that the owner pointed out is that the rear window wiper intermittently decides to stop working. Maybe some water got in there or something. Lastly, he had um, some, some tie rods replaced and sway bar bushings. And I'd say for a 12, 13, going on a 13 year old truck right now, that is very, very good as far as reliability goes. This has withstood time and abuse, towing and use. Very minimal repairs. So if any of you are considering buying a used Toyota Sequoia, you, really, you can't go wrong with it, but just make sure when you get there, there's no rust holes, there's no rot. Switch it into four high and four low and lock the center diff and make sure all that stuff really mingles and works well. That's pretty much that. Uh, I do recommend these vehicles for what they are. They're reliable, stout, family haulers um, that can tow. Otherwise, there's much more sensible options, much more luxurious options out there that get better gas mileage and still have a lot of room. Alrighty, thank you guys for watching. I really do appreciate it. Don't click subscribe because I'm an idiot. Uh, definitely click down vote on the video. That really helps my metrics. It helps my self-esteem. Uh, makes me want to make more videos like this one. Stay tuned for some more videos on Toyotas, Hondas, Pagani, Zondas. See what I did there that rhymed. All right, take care now. Bye-bye then. Look at this. There's a little kid looker mirror, creeper mirror. You just go, listen, Jeremiah, knock it off. Hey, how's it going? You forgot your tripod. Thank you very much. You forgot your tripod.